Hello. Okay, your time starts now. Hello, my name is Andreas. Um, I'm the group 15, and I would like to present to you my idea about an alpine climbing bag that is adjustable. Uh, that is a general a bag that can be adjusted to the needs of the user. The product in itself is uh, customer specific, meaning that you would uh, take your need and define the product. Not the other way around, as we see today, that the user define their need and go out to the market and try to actually find something that actually fit them uh, and have to uh, uh, go on compromise with some of the details. Um, it's both details, but it's also essential parts. I tried to illustrate on my slide some of the important things that uh, just for some of the major companies uh, on the market uh, at the moment is not a not something you can uh, choose yourself, but is uh, done by the company. Uh, that is in general what I want to aim for. What I uh, tried to look more detail into was that uh, I would not aim at all the segments, all market uh, types at the first uh, time. So uh, I chose to go into uh, outdoor market, just as um, I have a lot of knowledge in this market, but also because I know that uh, the economical potential here is uh, higher that the customer wants to pay a higher price for a, a better product. Just because, before continuing, um, I just want to uh, uh, make a short comment that uh, the customer integration in development is also part of the project, as I have already integrated a lot of people um, from all over Europe. I'll come back to that. The market size is approximately 7.68 million uh, alpinists, but as uh, also stated, there is a lot of people who is uh, actually also buying this kind of segments product, but not uh, defined, uh, using it specifically for alpine uh, exposures um, trips. And that's a, uh, also the second segment of my product. So there's a large potential. This. Um, as I see it, I have to go, as I go really specific into a market and try to aim at the really uh, nerds, I have to, uh, to not just aim for Denmark, but I have to aim larger than that. And that's why I used uh, Europe as my reference point for this project. My short-term plan uh, at the moment is I... Uh, I've made uh, this uh, crowdsourcing of uh, details at a lot of uh, forums on uh, the internet and uh, also made uh, own um, friends and experts uh, in the Danish market come up with um, suggestions, ideas and how they um, would like their bag to actually be. And uh, this session I would end in this month and... Uh, from these details, I want to translate them into a prototype. Um, also, in order to uh, hand out the product, uh, prototype to other people, and so that they can give um, response. That's part of the test. Um, and therefore, I would uh, develop it into the first model. The first model uh, should be sold as uh, stated number one in the bottom uh, by crowdfunding. Uh, the reason is that I I know there is a large potential by the people who I've already um, uh, got into my project uh, because they are really um, motivated to help me, but also wanted to actually get this product. Therefore, um, later I will go into the shop system, and that's also part of my um, long-term strategy. Because a large part of my long-term strategy is that I want to expand my my product segment so that I also have products that is specialized for water sports and other segments, but that is also still adjustable for the segment in itself. And as you can see on my short timeline here, that should be an arrow in the end, that um, 
when the uh, short-term plan ends, when the first model is uh, out, I would start uh, developing new bags that uh, fit other needs in order to um, keep up with my um, uh, the knowledge about I'm an expert uh, company that sells uh, bags for experts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect time. Take questions from the floor, please. Yes, I think we should definitely start with some questions from the floor, if uh, anyone has any. Brilliant. Lady at the back. Hey, sorry? What is your production strategy? Production strategy. Thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, one of the th things that is uh, essential to this product is are you either going to uh, produce um, one bag for each customer that's highly costly, or are you going to uh, make it adjustable for each, uh, uh, semi adjustable, or in which direction? What I've come up with, and I'm uh, sorry that I didn't have time for, to show you in this five minutes, is a system that enables me to actually produce one bag, I know it's a little cheating, but adjust it to the customer needs so that um, the details that I showed you on, uh, on this page, but also a lot of others uh, that I didn't have the possibility to show you when I have it on, is that uh, you can actually um, adjust it so that you can the details you put on it afterwards of take off uh, defines the special need. Was that answer enough? So that I will just produce it in uh, Poland or China, as I stated earlier, uh, as one back, just as the competitors. I think there was another question. Yeah, I'm curious, Thank you for questioning. Thank you. This is uh, the way I calculated my market size. Um, I low, know that um, it's roughly, but I took the amount of uh, DAO members, that is uh, the Deutsche Alpinist uh, uh, Federation, and um, I took the, the, how many Germans there was. Uh, German is a country that had a lot of uh, both climbers and alpinists, but it's not always everybody that is in this, and that gives me 1.84% of alpinists, and therefore I calculated it. It's including Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go to my success criteria because that's part of what you said and uh, how far I will reach this. I will reach my success criteria in, um, in one year. Uh, that, that's from the selling date. So sorry for just wrapping back and forth. Um, I see this is uh, in two years. So that I will already in one year start developing another bag. Yes, um, I do. I don't have a slide for this, but um, there is companies like Silo Gear who actually make uh, adjustable bags um, for these purposes. They have a, a, a they are not in, in uh, Europe uh, that much at the moment, and uh, they have a have a flaws about quest, um, integration of users and also um, flaws in their way of uh, pricing as they are also um, trying to do it even more specific than uh, that the, uh, the bags I do. Um, but there is also a lot of, when uh, just another part of your question was the, um, the bags that is for, for general, more general use, there's a lot of competition in that market. Um, I, um, I located more than uh, 250 different uh, bags in this market, the more generalized uh, bags, and there is more than that. Um, so that's really a highly competitive market. But I 
before going to that, I would have to have my um, my um, marketing so that they already that the market already know that I am an expert in specialized products. Um, I think uh, alpinists usually want to have uh, quite light equipment when walking uphill. Would it be a problem if you uh, have to make it so customizable that the weight of the product will go up compared to uh, normal backpacks? I strive not to do that. But uh, you are right, that's one of the, the key thing about this. Also, the material choice. Um, I have several uh, the dealer um, for uh, manufacturing and uh, clothing, uh, and I talk with them about uh, the weight of the material because it's really important. That's where you really can save a lot of weight and also the buckles. So that's actually, compared to that you maybe have to put in an extra buckle, that's not where you really um, save a lot of weight. But on the, on the SD, I, I'm going to, sorry? I'm going to make estimates about um, weight also uh, when you uh, choose or uh, do not choose, uh, for instance, buckle on the sides or like, so that you can actually see how much you save, because that's also an important part. But good question. And at the shop, and, uh, how are users going to actually you know, uh, size up to the different, different sections? I mean, is it going to be small, medium, large, or do they actually have to measure themselves up? That's a good question, and that's in relation also to what the young lady said in the background. Um, in the start, I'm not able to make uh, fully adjust a uh, bag that is sized for the one user. I had that idea, but um, it's really hard to make a product that uh, is defined by one special need as that will cost a lot in the production. So in the first step, I'm going to make two sides, and then afterwards, I'm going to maybe expand that, um, and that's part of uh, developing the product uh, later on, also when it is sold, because I don't have the capacity to actually develop a lot of bags, and then at one, release it. I have to make it as an iterative process, but also, combined with a sales process. But hopefully later on, it would be a possibility because that's what I'm striving for, that the user can define even more. Okay. If I uh, may ask a question now. Um, how much do you think this premium of being customizable adds to the value of your product? So how much do you think you can charge for one of your bags beyond what a normal bag you could charge for? A normal bag in this segment is for around 1,000 to uh, 2,000 kroners, sometimes even higher. I think that uh, for my details um, and making people choosing, um, of course they have to pay for the details, but uh, I think that I can charge 500 kroners extra for that detail. Also, f as, um, but I also, there's one point, if I may, that's um, about the quality. I really have to ensure the uh, the quality, uh, I, I stated that I have to test and inspect of all models. Maybe it's too much to test all models, but I have to inspect all models because that's part of the renome. <coughs> I cannot have one flaw um, in the models. So you'll charge about 50% extra onto each bag than a normal bag? 25 Okay, if it's 2,000. Yeah, because it's okay. 50. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, you've used uh, different fora uh, for uh, getting knowledge about what your, essentially what your customer needs. Uh, could you say something about what methods you used, how you approached that? That would be nice to hear. Yes. Um, I want to, um, to crowdsource the design in order to... Um, that's a hard thing to, um, to do, especially when you have worked a lot on it. But I want to, um, to, to put out everything, you know, a lot of the thing I've made um, about the design and uh, make people come and comment so that I don't make something that is not needed. Um, and what I essentially did was I located a lot of homepages. And in the beginning, um, I thought that I was going to aim for one. but. Uh, I actually aim for more pages, and um, 
And on these pages, uh, I got some response, and then I went into a dialogue in the end. Because first I let people uh, comment, and, and when there was about 10, 15 comments, and I then started the dialogue. So um, we had the dialogue uh, centered around my product and my drawings, because then the starting point would be what I made and, and not what... Um, okay. Because a lot of them will refer to something they have used. Um, so therefore, we have different uh, starting points. I hope that's answer enough. That's fine. That's great. OK, I think we'll have to uh, move on now. The time's up for yeah. questions. Thank you for all your questions, and thank you yeah. to the speaker. Thank you. So we have the uh, next group down. Which group number are you? Two. 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 Four, in my way. Yeah. Thank you. Slides, uh, just need to uh, copy it onto the desktop first. Okay. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one, start. Okay. We're Grip2, and our product is the Ease Inject. In short, our value proposition is that Ease Inject, unlike any other existing solution, will make the daily injections for diabetics more comfortable, safe, and accurate at an affordable price. Our team consists of Sophie, Mikael, Tors, and my name is Sam. And I'm a diabetic myself. This means that I uh, know of the physical and psychological problems that diabetics encounter. Problems that are far more widespread than most people realize as there are 366 million diabetics worldwide. Most people would feel insecure about injecting themselves. A feeling that I can relate to and that many diabetics struggle with. Um, even though the perception of discomfort is a bit exaggerated in most perceptions. Uh, it, it is not completely unfounded. Every time you inject yourself, there is a risk of hitting a nerve in the dermis or in the muscle fascia, which uh, can be very uh, painful. This causes diabetics to inject into their safe zones, areas where they know that the, the risk of uh, painful injections is the lowest, and the result is lipohypertrophy, seen here, and skin complications, which in turn leads to uh, uncontrolled uptake of insulin and an impaired treatment and life quality. Practitioners widely agree that this is a significant problem within diabetes treatment, and in addition, major studies have shown that uh, despite giving ba basic instructions, more than 50% of diabetics develop lipohypertrophy. And so most diabetics would benefit from a solution offering a more comfortable and safe injection. Um, one would typically inject the insulin by making a little skin fold. But as Søren said, it very, it's very important that the, there's no muscle tissue in the skin fold, as this will make the injection quite painful. Therefore, one would want a skin fold only consisting of fat tissue and our product idea is to make a device that can help creating the skin fold only consisting of fat. Here we must consider the angle of the skin fold created, also a locking mechanism to keep the skin fold stable during injection, and of course the ergonomic shape and friction against the skin are also important parameters. All in all, our product desirables is to minimize the pain and maximize comfort during injection and also enable two-hand injection. If 
Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, for this, we've got a market of potentially 366 million diabetics, but only 100 million use insulin by injection as the treatment, and that's therefore our market. Um, unfortunately, only 30% of these is, let's say, rich enough to buy our products. So we've got a potential market of 30 million. Um, within that market, the main users are between 50 and 80 years old, so we need to make a solution that is directed at those people. Um, and a market entry strategy would be to divide it into three steps. We would start out in Denmark to sell to the 100,000 Danish users by um, pharmacies and diabetic ambulatories where the diabetes patients come in when they get the, the sickness and they are trained in how to, to, uh, to medicate themselves and we put our product in there. And then afterwards we would go to step two and three and we would join up with a bigger company in license. The global market uh, for diabetes is uh, rapidly expanding and uh, it's expected that in uh, 2016 it will exceed 114 billion uh, US dollars. And when the market is uh, big uh, as that, uh, there's a lot of competitors. Instead of seeing this uh, as an obstacle, we try to see this as an opportunity. Um, when we look at our patterning, uh, we try to aim for a pretty simple design, and this means that we have to look at uh, how we can pattern either uh, the design or the functionality of the product. Um, we have tried to make a team profile consisting of our entrepreneurial skills, and as you see, we lack some experience within uh, venture capital, small business, uh, and sales marketing. Okay. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. <laughs> Any questions from the floor? Let's go here. First of all, what is the two hand injection <coughs> and what is one hand injection? Yeah. As normally, uh, when you inject, you use one hand uh, to, to hold your skin fold, um, try to form your t skin fold, and then you use your other hand for, for the insertion of the, of the insulin. And if you could make a device that could lock this skin fold, then you could, if you are an elderly uh, person, you could use two hands to, to inject uh, the insulin. So that was the thought of that. Functionality. Yeah, and that's if you are an elderly person, you you can have some some difficulties to 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 uh, to um, when you're shaking maybe uh, and hold this pen. No one always has made a, a pen that you use for injection, uh, but still you have to to inject carefully and you have to push the button to, to inject the, the right amount of insulin and so on. And that probably could uh, help the, the people to, to inject more easily. Mm -hmm. cool. There's a question there as well, in the middle. How would you price the, 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 the shoulder compared yeah. to, the, to the needle? Um, the needle costs around seven kroners per day in use. Yeah. Um, but that's not the expensive bit. The expensive bit is the test strips you use to test your blood glucose uh, amount, and that's 40 kroners a day yeah. in average. So we're thinking about it's it's a, it's a matter between life expectancy of our product and then the pricing, of course. Um, in long term, we're thinking of that making a solution that we could put into every package, perhaps. Um, but to start out, we're going to make a I think a one month. Um, solution that would cost somewhere between 200 and 300 kroners, something like that. There's a question over here. Yeah, I just want to ask actually just uh, relative to selling as part of an uh, injection kit, so does that mean that you only use it once, you only need one in a lifetime? Or, I mean, would you only need one of these products in a lifetime as a diabetic? Or no, 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 not at all, not at all. I think we would design it in such a manner that it would be it will be profitable to, to, to shift it or, or buy another mm -hmm. one. We will place it at the pharmacy as well, buy the insulin pen. So when you go and buy a new box consisting of five for, I think that's for two months use, five pens, you would get offered a new one and then it would be at a so reasonable price that you could probably buy a new one. We haven't thought that through quite yet. Okay. 
And how do you normally buy uh, insulin? Does it come in packs of five? In Denmark it does, yes. Okay. So it could be just an ad, ad free addition to the pack of five? That's okay. the long term goal okay. of it as well, yes. Okay. Did you say in the beginning that you wanted to make it cheaper than the existing solutions? Yeah, cheaper than the existing solutions, but the How existing... How are you going to make it cheaper by adding a new function and taking <coughs> and do research and development? Come again? How are you going to make it cheaper by adding a new function and a new product to the current solution? We're not making the, the, the process cheaper. We're making the, what do you call it, treatment something cheaper, the, the whole aspect of it. What's the main problem today is that a lot of people inject sunset into their safe zones and that has got some, some physiological and psychological damages for you as the patient, but in uh, the society that's an enormous expense as well. So I think within the Danish society, our first off market, we would make them buy or at least support the solution, making it cheaper for the customer to buy it. <coughs> talked about angle um, and my question is isn't it hard to calculate the angle depend isn't it depending on the how much fat there is, actually is on the patient and therefore you also need to make a fat test uh, uh, before you size it yeah that's right but there are guidelines for the pen if it should come like 45 or 90 degrees um, but that's definitely a challenge and also something that we, we have developed some concepts for the functions and that's definitely a challenge to sort of make guidelines that can fit onto the average person or, yeah. Um, my sister is a type 1 diabetic and she's working as a model and has not a lot of excess fat or skin. And she has a problem with bruising when she's uh, trying to grab the fold. Will would this sort of increase the bruising, increase the bruising, or would it make make less bruises? Because I could imagine that if you if you have something that locks the skin and then you you stick in, and then you would have more bruising than, than the usual. Well, the bruising would normally come from puncturing of uh, capillaries or, or such, and. There are far more capillaries in the muscle fascia, um, so if you could avoid injecting into the muscle fascia, you would avoid the bruising. But uh, there are also capillaries in the dermis, so it, it would not be completely safe, but it would help. Uh, before the last two questions, can we have uh, a member from Group 3 down to the front to load up your presentation, please? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, should your product be uh, co-opted with all the different uh, types of insulin pens, or have you chosen a specific pen to which you can uh, instruct and supervise? Well, our, our hope is that, uh, for instance, Novo Nordisk will, would like to cooperate and, and, and use this for gaining a uh, competitive edge, um, conquering the newly diagnosed diabetics um, and having them as uh, lifetime uh, customers, um, but there, there's no reason why it wouldn't be, be usable for, for all sorts of pens, um, but it might be, be customized for, for individual pens. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that there's uh, definitely a need to, to validate these, uh, these assumptions with regards to friction and angle and all that. Uh, I suppose you have some references already at this point. Uh, what is your plan for actually validating that and showing that your product actually works going ahead now, um, looking forward? Um, we will go into the clinical trials, uh, starting with ourselves perhaps, um, as we all can make injections. Um, but uh, if we get to cooperate with the Stino Diabetes Center or uh, Novo Nordisk, they will probably have some, some uh, way of doing this. Um, Do the customers always pay for their prescriptions of um, insulin? Can it ever be provided on the health service or do you always have to pay for it? Well, it can be provided from the hospitals, but if uh, you isn't uh, inlagged, hospitalized, you'll have to go to the pharmacy and buy it there. And there's uh, some subsidiaries uh, that are uh, declining uh, depending on how much you buy. Okay.
So it could be, I mean, you said it's, you based your market size on uh, 30 million based on that. It's a little bit too expensive for the majority, but it may be yeah. that the health service picks up that yeah. additional uh, amount. Denmark at least. Okay. Go ahead. Um, something I also question when I see in your product um, is, don't you as a diabetic have the tendency to feel that this is, uh, that you feel sick, that you have a lot of things that you have to carry around and just adding another one would just even enhance that, that you have to put on this and put a needle in and then take off? Yeah, that, that, that's the thing we are very uh, <clears throat> concerned about. but. But this product isn't meant to, to be uh, a big uh, technical solution. It's more of a bandage-like thing, um, is one of the, the ideas, at least. Um, and also, it, it isn't necessarily something that you take around every, time, every day. Um, you could also just have one at home. Okay. Last question. Um, yeah, just one quick question. Uh, I see some sketches of your products, and I see a lot of different uh, ways of solving this. Um, you say that it's only 30% of the overall market that's actually well, essentially rich enough to buy your product. How much, uh, how much cheaper should it be for you to get, let's say, the op opposite ratio of 70% of the market, maybe? Um, I think the 70% the who are not able to buy a product is based on the fact that they're from low- and middle-income countries. So that's just an assumption of what we suppose. Okay. Um, that's based on what pricing of insulin and uh, test strips are done as, on as well. But in steps two and three, when we go like European worldwide, when we go broader, uh, our product would be cheap as well. Um, and if we team up with Norman Nordisk and so on, they would be able to mass distribute it at a much lower price. Yeah. So yes. this Thanks is just based on our initial uh, market entry. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, team three, are you ready? Yes. Off you go. Yes, well, hi. Uh, we're Simi, and I'm going to talk about solar-powered energy systems. And I'm going to tell you all about what it is and who needs it. Well, Copenhagen is a city of bikes. You've all seen the bikes that you can just borrow for the day, bike around, park it somewhere, get your money back. Well, in Denmark, there's 2,000 of these bikes, and none of them have lights. In Europe, there's another 90,000 of them. And the world, in total, around 200,000 of these borrow SUO bikes. You've seen them, heaps of advertising on them. That's how they make money, these companies. Well. Our idea was, why don't we provide them with lights? Not just to increase the safety of the bicycle uh, cyclist uh, so he can ride at night, but also to be able to make these companies promote their advertising even more. Putting lights on it, and also, if people bike at night, the bikes will be shown much more than if they just do use during daylight. So, what we've come up with is a system based on flexible solar panels, flexible LED lights, and yeah, batteries and circuits and all that goes into this electronic stuff. Because on these bikes, as I said, there's a heaps of advertisement, but not on top of the mudguards, because you can't really see that from the street. So this is a perfect sur uh, surface to apply this solar panel. You wouldn't take space from advertisement or anything, but you will get the energy you need for your lights. So, how do we get into the bike manufacturing industry? It's kind of conservative, and the bikes are already there. But this is where we're lucky, because here in Copenhagen, they're designing new bikes that's going to be introduced next year. 
The design process is already ongoing, and this is where we come in. We're gonna collaborate with these designers to make a whole new mud guard for the city bikes of Copenhagen. We're gonna incorporate our idea with the solar panel and LED lights onto the new mud guards of these bikes, which gives us 2,000 bikes to try our idea on. See, does it work? We hope it will. And what does the customer say? What does the company say? And from there, we're gonna spread this to the bikes, city bikes around the world. And also, we don't think this is only a need in this industry. Also, you see in the private bikers, especially here, there's a million of them. And they also need lights and energy on their bikes. So, in the end, our energy system will be provided to private bikers. So you can buy your very special solar-powered mud guards. Well, so to conclude this, our system is a way of giving energy to your bike, not only for your lights, but also in the future, maybe you can incorporate a screen so you can have your map over the city you're biking around in. You, the company making city bikes will get another surface to put advertisement on, and also good for tourists or whoever wants to find the way while they're biking around. Um, and also, if you want to charge your phone or anything during, along the way, you can just plug it into this and it will be charged when you get there. So, that's all for us. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Got the back there. Uh, well, these solar panel works, even though it's cloudy, not as good, but still, they do work. So you will have a little battery that you would charge up. So hopefully, it, maybe if you're biking for eight hours in darkness, you wouldn't have enough energy for it. But going, you know, most people just go for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, and that would definitely be enough. Um, I don't know who was first. Let's go this guy. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering why you're going for the solar power and not for the uh, magnetic uh, generation of power instead. It seems to be more consistent. Uh, so. Contributions from the other? Um, yeah, we, we kind of thought that um, obviously there's a lot of other solutions on, on the market. Obviously the Dynamo solution. Um, we wanted to create something with, uh, hopefully we'll adapt uh, DTU technology which they've invented a new high flex solar panel uh, equipment here and we're going to try and do something with them as well to implement that with our design. So we're kind of differentiating ourselves a bit from the Dynamo solution with this solar powered uh, and also you, with the, with the, um, with the uh, solar paneling as well you get a lot more space to work with, I mean like around the, uh, the, the rim of the wheel or not the rim but the centre of the wheel you can, you can lay it over with this solar paneling as well for future, so to try and absorb as much solar energy as possible. So that's the kind of idea we wanted to try to... Okay. Yeah. Um, furthermore, the, the Dynamo system, the cheap ones at least, has a tendency of stop lighting um, whenever you meet a cross section and you stop biking. So with a solar powered system, you will avoid this uh, dangerous situation for the bike. I think that's the answer to the solar power technology. As far as I know, the solar power needs to have a very certain angle to the sun to be effective at all, and you need to have a power transformer. And what about the weight and the cost? All of it seems to be very. But of course, if, if uh, you can defend that and it's cost effective and it's more effective than other solutions, I guess it's okay. But it seems, yeah. from here, it seems unrealistic. Yeah, we just made the, the simple schematic up there, but we actually uh, looked at components the other day and are going to make a layout soon, and it's just very small components. You can get a battery charger, like this big, and, and everything, so we should be able to make a very small board and build it into maybe a little box like this or something. So, 
I, I think that question was more aimed at the effectiveness of the solar panels in yeah. situation. Yeah. Um, in the city with high, high rise buildings and shades. And yeah, that'll, that'll be hard, but we, we hope we can get enough energy. We don't know. Okay. Um, one of you yes. said that there was a the duration in which the bikes were to be used was approximately half an hour. But if you uh, put city bikes with the diets on, um, wouldn't the, the ambition be to have the bikes going around all night long uh, and have shift users for every half hour? And yeah, if you can make people go around all night long. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's not probable that that the bikes would be used all night because people don't bike all night long. Uh, furthermore, the bikes are taken inside uh, f uh, between November and March, I think, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So so in the win winter month, it wouldn't be um, realistic anyway. Yeah. Um, for the initial uh, setup, we're obviously aiming at city bikes. And we're trying to uh, design something that's a robust a robust mudguard with with like three LED lights maybe at the back and three in the front. So you know the the amount of energy that's needed to power LEDs is quite minimal, and with the battery that we're going to use and with the charging that goes over, I mean even in Copenhagen, if you had six hours of sunlight, at the angles, I mean these we've set up circuits before, a rough circuit that you know was charging inside with the UV that was coming in the window, and was giving us energy. Okay, not it wasn't super energy, but we feel that with this technology that's improving and with the cheaper circuits that are coming from China and, and wherever, uh, we can really create a circuit that can you know, work, especially for the initial phase, and then hopefully in the future, with new technologies, we can okay. get more energy out of it. Okay, just to the back. Would it be possible to, to combine the solar panel and, and uh, the magnetic diamond? Is that would uh, give you a combination that will have uh, sufficient energy at all times, even when the grid machine? Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. At the back, at the very back. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I know that the normal solar panels they are not so expensive, but I get the flexible one will, will be more expensive. What about uh, comparing that price with the Dyno and why the company don't prefer your system instead of the Dyno system if it might be cheaper? Yeah, from research we, we looked at uh, the Dynamo model that has a capacitor in it that can basically store energy for around two minutes. So if you're stopped at a light, and it'll keep on flashing, whereas the cheaper version of the Dynamo is, I think it stops flashing. When the, obviously when you stop cycling, mm -hmm. so um, you know with the, with the cost, I think it's something like fifty euros um, for for one of those systems, the kind of the higher quality dyno system. Um, our our system, you know, with the components that we hope to use, we, we really don't think it's going to be a fraction. Of, well, maybe thirty euros, uh, you know, for for something like that. But we do have to do more research on the component costs. Okay, let's go ahead. Yeah, the, we're really going to, with, with the design team that we're going to be working with, hopefully uh, from Shorta, we're going to try and design something that's quite robust and will take a good kick. <laughs> Did you want to? Yeah, that was my question actually. Have you considered the vandalism to people that uh, aim for destroying the product? Um, I think, I mean, from where I'm from, it's uh, vandalism is quite, you know, quite a quite a thing that happens. I mean, in, in Copenhagen, I know vandalism occurs, but obviously that's going to be taken into consideration. But we don't want to have a, a steel mudguard either, you know. Or, so yeah, that we'll have to take that into consideration. Okay, let's go one more from the audience. Yeah. Um, <coughs> have you looked into how many bikes in other areas have the built-in lights already? Because I've been to Spain and they have built-in lights, and I've been to Portugal and they already have lights on their bikes, and I've been to Paris and they have it, and I'm pretty sure they have it in Stockholm as well. So, how big a percentage of the bikes does actually need the lights? And have you asked the design team whether they're going to include lights in the project already? Mm. Yeah, we we have we've noticed that they do use bikes a lot, bicycle lights for for instance in the Vailib system in Paris. Uh, they use the Dynamo system. I think they use the Dynamo system in. in but our initial kind of step in the process is to try and create a, an energy solution for what, we, what we're assuming that the bikes are going to get a lot smarter in the future. So basically, we're, we're trying to create a solar-powered solution that will substitute that. Yeah. 
And also, uh, a lot of those bikes have uh, batteries. I know the ones in Stockholm has. So the companies need to go and change and stuff. And this, having solar panel, you, they don't want to have to care about it. They will work. But the thing but is, you need to store energy until, until you actually need the lights. So you will need batteries as well. And then you will actually add a maintenance cost for all your bikes instead of the dynamo that just runs when you bike. Yeah, but uh, because it's a rechargeable battery, you don't have to change it as you know, if you just have a battery powered light. And you know, not all bikes use the dynamos. In Sweden, they have batteries and so. Oh. And, and just on the dynamo system, I mean, we're obviously in, we're trying to prototype a, something that's durable, that's lightweight and uses the minimum amount of components. So with the dynamo, obviously with more moving components, there's obviously gonna be more damage susceptible to that sort of product. So we're trying to create something that maybe, you know, gets rid of that, that sort of thing. Uh, can I have uh, one member from Team 8 down to the front, please, to uh, load up their presentation? Um, yep. Well, the, uh, I think that's uh, enough from the questions from the floor. I just had uh, at least one question for you. I th well, I, before saying that, first of all, it's nice to hear a lot of te technical discussions. I see that we're still at the, the DTU. That's no worries. Thanks. Thanks. Um, just one question. Um, it seems that... Uh, you need to do some work on, on finding out what makes these bikes tick because I think you've already pointed it out that you know the advertising and it's also you saw the case with Tim the other day the advertising is essentially what pays for these bikes how could you think your product in with regards to advertising I'm thinking solar cells are you know a green a kind of initiative something that can be shown as a city can represent itself throughout solar cells but can you think of other ways? I know this is a bit of a hard question, but could you think of other ways that your product can help this, you know, advertising dimension of uh, of what you're essentially looking into, digging into this, you know, advertising on city bikes? Uh, if you have in in, uh, in theory, you could just you could put extra lights in on the commercials, so when you bike at nighttime, mm -hmm. you will also see the commercials more clearly. But the the branding aspect is is really important. For Even us. at a standstill, right? Mm -hmm. You could have it uh, even lit uh, when the bike is at a standstill. I think um, when you look at the London bikes, they're sponsored by a single sponsor. So if you could find a single sponsor where these lights could be integral to the sponsorship, then you might have a, a bit of a solution there. Um, a, a current, I was going to hit on the same question. I'm not convinced that this really benefits the sponsorship at the moment or the advertising. Um. We also, for future development, obviously, um, you know, in terms of city bikes, we we were also discussing uh, the, the display system, you know, where you have a map on the front, and if we could hopefully uh, adapt our circuitry to charge something that could be changed to do, to show either a map, kind of like the Kindle device, you know, where you can kind of display a, a pattern, mm -hmm. and then that's also in the pipeline as well. This, this idea, this our first phase is just a kind of a showcase for what we could potentially get out of the circuit okay. and what kind of energy we might be able to suck out. I, uh, I might add that this group has also gone through a, a phase of uh, killing two projects so far. So they're restarting on this one at the moment. So we've uh, got to give them a little bit of slack. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, teammates. Thank you. Are you ready? Yes. Three, two, one. We're Team 8, and we, have on, uh, we are developing an application on, on smartphones. Uh, we call it Cookiesi. Uh, it sounds a bit Italian, Cookiesi, and it's about cooking. And uh, we want to help people to, to, who don't like cooking to, to cook. And they uh, maybe, uh, or, or people who would like to have more fun cooking to, to have more fun cooking. So uh, look at this guy. He, is, uh, he can't cook. He don't like to cook, and, but he, he really wants to cook because he thinks it's expensive to always go to restaurants and, and, and buy uh, food uh, uh, from uh, Just Eat or, or order it. So he finds our app and now he starts cooking using our app and it's easy, it takes him step by step. And 
he impresses his uh, parents-in-law and his friends and, and everybody, and, and he saves money, has fun, and uh, he eats more healthy. So basically, uh, the value for the other actors, for example, uh, is created by uh, the app, because the app will show the user a list of ingredients, a list of utensils, and will go step by step uh, instructing the user what to do in the kitchen, uh, timing his actions uh, through audio, video, and text, uh, or all the above. Uh, it will also include a platform for the user to create his own recipes. For example, he wants to store his grandmother's sauce. He can look at his grandmother and develop her recipe and explain in step for other people how to make this incredible sauce his grandmother always used to make and share it with all his friends on Facebook. But uh, the, the value for us is this guy, he's going to stop shopping from Domino's, McDonald's, Pizza Hut and start shopping from Natto, Thorfisk uh, and, and stuff like that. And, and so we're going to sell them advertisements. They will have their logos by the list of ingredients, they will, they will uh, be displayed uh, in, in, in audio and video, and also uh, we'll have some health uh, promotion, and hopefully we'll get some support from Sunhas Dirasen or maybe uh, health programs by the European Union. Yeah. Um, well, um our app will be placed uh, on the App Store market in uh, lifestyle, health, healthcare, and education. Um, uh, we have targeted uh, English speaking countries. So um, we have found out that, uh, for, for example, in USA, 50% uh, already have a smartphone, uh, where uh, two out of three are overweight. Uh, so we see them um, who has a need for a lifestyle change. Um, so that's approximately 65 million who have a, who are all weighted and have a smartphone. Um, we found out that 43% um, already buy uh, through their smartphone. Uh, and uh, in average, uh, and yeah, smartphone users are uh, app users, so in average, uh, in USA, uh, they use uh, 11 apps over 30 days, so, but six of them are paid. Yeah. Um, more specific, as an example, we were looking at the, the UK market uh, as a first entry. Um, the UK market is exciting because it's English speaking. Uh, Yes, uh, they have some health issues with the overweight people, and uh, we also think they have a bad food conscience. We want to improve that, maybe. Um, the, here's our estimations that we end up with 507,000 users in the UK as a potential. Uh, yeah, you can see the calculations. Uh, some goals to achieve before we can go into the market, we need to program the app. They will need a voice recognition license. We heard that Apple has some, a lot of license due to the Cybe software. Um, then we need uh, some recipes, we need to consider there's copyrights on a lot of them, so we need some uh, without copyrights. Then we need server space, we need to uh, review and approve by Google and Apple to get into the App Store, we need to grant permission. Then we need to advertise and marketing our product, people need to know our product, and then we need uh, in the future uh, feature expansion, uh, more possibilities. Ten seconds. Um, here we use uh, Porter's Five Force. Uh, to analyze the barriers in order for success. And our barrier threat is medium to high. We don't have much. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there. Okay. But thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? This lady here. Yeah, I was just thinking um, how, what does make this app? different from me just Googling recipes on the internet than like having a whole health pro if I want to change my lifestyle, can you just log on and log everything and eat again all the yeah. recipes I need to change? I, I know what you're talking about. This is totally different from anything existing on the internet because uh, because uh, this is uh, something that leads you in real time, step by step. The, all the others is just uh, uh, 
just a, a list of ingredients and, and, and some text of what to do. It doesn't, doesn't uh, time everything for you. And everything you put into the oven, it doesn't time anything. So it's like time management. That's the unique factor. Um, can I also say something? Okay, um, I will say that um, this app, uh, it's, uh, you don't have to interact with it. You, know, you don't have to take it with your hands. So it's already speaking to you. And that's what we see as a good part of this. Um, I just wanted to be a little more detailed with your question. Um, let's say that you're a beginner, right? And you have a list of ingredients. First of all, we're going to focus on having recipes with very small uh, list of ingredients. This way it can be easier to cook. Um, and you will only, you will have your ingredient list. And at the same time, uh, because you have your cell phone there, it will also show you a picture of the ingredient. Because many of us, when we try to cook something different, we have no idea how the ingredients look. And we still have to look, you know, in another browser to see how that picture looks like. Um, another thing is that uh, it will also give us an idea if, for example, if you want to do something more stylish, you want to cut julienne style carrots, it will give you a video there of how you can do this. So you we're going over and adding a little more value to your style and at the same time making it easier. Okay. Um, uh, did you want to ask a question? Yes. <laughs> Anna, yes, you. Uh, I, was just think, uh, I was just thinking about the uh, issue you yourself that you don't have any competitors because you have this time. Uh, yeah, this is why we have this slide. It's actually medium to high threat, and this is because we don't have much copyright protections. However, we do have a competitive advantage as first movers, so if we enter strong into the market, that will be our competitive advantage. At the back. Did you have your hand up, Sek, here? Yeah? yeah, I was just wondering if the whole thing is <coughs> real time. Um, what, what if someone, I'm not uh, as good as Jamie Oliver is cutting onions. And what if I get behind the real time? Uh, the, it's, for example, you're cooking and somebody puts a doorbell on. Uh, then you can uh, say, uh, I want to stop cooking. And it will automatically pause everything and and it will, uh, what do you say, alter, uh, move, move the whole timing. And then you can go answer the door and say, yeah, I'm cooking and come in or whatever. And then you say, ah, I want to start cooking again. And it starts the timing again. Yeah. And also the you. settings will have slow, medium, or high, depending on the speed that you want the voice recognition. So that's always helpful for the beginners. But does that answer your question? So, uh, you, there, yeah. I'm the lucky, uh, person, uh, I actually made a cookbook and send it out, just print out, and you may not underestimate the quality of the uh, of the recipes, and uh, you have to bring in people that is good at this, or either you you have to copy of the recipes, yeah. Yeah. which is illegal. Yeah, we also want to substitute some ingredients because we have vegetarians, we have people that are allergic, and uh, we want to bring in people that will be able to give us a guide and say, okay, what are the ingredients that can be replaced depending on your lifestyle? This gentleman here. Yeah. Uh, I have just one question. Are you sure about the unique thing about features about the application? Because I have in mind that I came across already an application from the App Store. I think it was named Dishi, but I'm not sure about the name. And it, it worked like this, that you were choosing the articles you have in your fridge, and then it was telling you what you need to buy, and then it was provided by step-by-step -step in real-time cooking time production. So it was telling me that now I should boil my potatoes, and the time is this and this, and while I'm doing this, I should prepare the meat and stuff like that. So. Okay, we haven't looked into that. The closest thing that we have to this is the Nintendo DS. You can actually buy something for like $20, and it will kind of walk you. But in order for this to happen, you have to have a Nintendo DS. Do you want a question? Um, a, few years, a few weeks ago, Thomas uh, put out a slide on campus that said, I save a business pitch mm -hmm. about that intelligent marketing at home thing. Have you considered to put in some of that to give the the, the shops and and the, 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 the 
to so make them uh, to make them to make them sell your product instead of just you pushing the product. You mentioned some of it, but mm. you could put it up to like public advertising or something. Yeah, we we thought about that uh, because uh, we want a collaboration uh, with uh, big uh, retailers. Uh, they they usually have their own apps and their own developers. So uh, we wanna we wanna develop our our program very well and have it very uh, usable and, and likable, so they will rather uh, collaborate with us instead of stealing our idea. But I Rayman has always got one, so you would be in competition with them. Yeah, uh, they, 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 we haven't seen anything like this, but uh, I, I haven't seen the, the, the program the gentleman behind you was talking about. But uh, uh, we think uh, we have a pretty unique idea anyway. And then also one idea that we didn't mention, we plan eventually the voice recognition to be by famous artists. Um, famous people just to get a little more attention. You know, you get to hear the, the voice of your favorite person walk you through your, you know, your favorite recipe. So that would just be a little touch. Just go ahead. Yeah, it's just if people are as incompetent as you expect uh, regarding food. You would, you would want to, to go into the shopping part as well, because uh, one of the big parts of making food is buying all the stuff. That is true. We so. also plan on our suppliers. We're working with uh, who our suppliers should be, and some of them are, of course, local markets, and at the same time, the markets that are able to deliver the products. So we want to integrate something where, if you want to, uh, you get your ingredients delivered to your place, and it makes your cooking even more easier, and you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Last question from the floor. Hey, it's actually just something that you should know, because I've been playing around with the idea of making an app as well, and you should always try to keep it below 20 megabytes, because otherwise you have to log on to the wireless network. Yeah. And I've only ever downloaded one app that's more than 20 megabytes because I think it's so annoying. I don't even bother logging into the wireless, even if I'm on or close to a wireless. I will never ever do it because I think it's so annoying. Mm. So if you want to include voice recognition and videos and so on and so forth, you will end up with like a 40 or 50 meg megabyte app and then you yeah. will have nobody downloaded it. <coughs> we, we bypass that by having it. You need to be connected to the internet while you're cooking. So you uh, pay per, per play of per recipe. Like half a krona or something, uh, if you if you like the if you like the app, and then the application actually go fetches the video, plays it, streams it from the internet, so it's not part of the program. It's also I'm not sure if that's such a problem because you'll probably be using this app presumably in your own kitchen, um, in which case you'll probably be already logged onto your your home Wi-Fi anyway. Oh, right. Uh, no, personally, I use my Wi-Fi when I'm at home. Yeah, me too. Okay. Uh, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I, I have. Uh, well, I have a few questions, but I don't think we have uh, time for them all. Uh, I think one very important question is that you tend to. It seems like you are uh, pointing out three different. Uh, I wouldn't say needs. You have uh, the first one. You t talk about you know this guy wanting to cook, but he doesn't know how. That's like one need uh, in one group. And then you have this. You go into this general investigation of uh, where do you have obese people and where do you have a need for doing something about that and you couple that to smartphone uh, you know integration and that's I think that's very wise of you as well and then finally you have this you know need of uh, or sorry this intention of the uh, companies Tesco's and Sainsbury's wanting to take away business from the Pizza Hut's and the McDonald's and um, how do you sort of see partnerships Covering those uh, three needs because some of it is very, you know, a national priority, uh, sort of uh, relates to national priorities. Something is, you know, down to earth, and some of it is really commercial, hardcore, uh, you know, cynical stuff. Uh, so, how, how are you going to balance that? Uh, I'm, I'm going to look a, a bit into Google advertisement, how, how their system works, and because they're very developed in, in collaboration between big companies and, and small companies uh, and po pointing their ass to particular people and, and trying to to have a collaboration with those uh, who are the best at, at this uh, uh, 
uh, intellectual advertisement. Okay. Um, okay. Just a, a quick comment rather than a question to finish. Uh, I think your, your business has some, some value in it. It's got a value proposition, but I don't think it's tied together particularly well at the moment. You need to be clear who you're going to be selling this to, uh, where you're going to extract the money from the market. You said it was kind of pay per use, but uh, I'm not really convinced that's the best route. Um, you also have some kind of tied to supermarkets and large chains, but it's not really clear um, how you make use of that and how you extract the value from it. So I think you really need to do a bit of work on your business model side. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. Oh, let's thank the group first. Uh, sorry, today, today's quite a tight agenda. I apologise for that, but we'll come back at quarter past if that's okay. Straight after the break, we're going to have groups 1, 9 and 14 presenting. So come and load your presentations up at the front.